Now, dear friends, Ezra has been very much upon my heart, so let us turn to the book of Ezra, the first chapter. And the second verse does set Cyrus, king of Persia. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. The fourth verse, Whosoever remaineth here in Babylon, in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, beside the free will offering for the house of God that is to be built. Now, it is amazing that there have been, you know, a friend of mine, a missionary, and his name was Merry Weather. We've been having some merry weather of late over here. And he was an Englishman. He used to sometimes complain about his wife. He would say, my wife is keeping me from heaven. <laughs> Whenever I get sick, she prays for me and I'm healed. And she is only 10 years older than me. <laughs> approaching hundreds, <laughs> both of them. Uh, she was close to 100 and waiting for that special congratulations and greetings from the queen. The queen you always used to send out a special greetings for all the citizens of UK who arrived at 100. However, this friend told me when he came over on follow, uh, the mission insisted, you must go and see this old lady. All right. He could not understand when he rode, rang the doorbell. This old lady, what? It's not a big house. It's not the kind of person whom the mission should tell me that it is a must. So he went in. It was a nicely appointed, modestly appointed place, small place. And he said, I cannot understand, ma'am, how it is that the mission insists that I should see you. Well, she said, all these years I have given to the Lord. But you don't have much. So she opened the window and said, Now all those houses on that street are mine. And what does an old body like me do with all that property? I give it to the Lord. This man was amazed. He was amazed. 
Here is a good old friend of mine. A wonderful man of great sacrifice. So, friends, you will find that some of the people who made sacrifices to send the good news into China, into some of the remotest places, Sudan, and so on, were people of real sacrifice. And here is this heathen king saying, Hey, who is there among you of all his people? Let him go. But if for some reason you cannot, now come on. Make sure that there is sufficient provision. And what did he himself do? He took all the plunder which his predecessor had brought back from the pillage and the plundering of God's house. All the gold and the silver. 5,400 assorted objects. Vessels of gold and silver. He said, look, bring it out of the storehouse. Send it back. You know, my dear friends, when I started, I had nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I never asked anybody for anything. But there was a prayer and a heart cry in me. The good news must be taken to the multitudes. And I did not know how this could ever be accomplished. Yet, as I see what God is doing, slowly unfolding, and people who have never heard the gospel message wondering, can this be true? Can such a thing be really true? Can people live like this today? My answer to that is always, okay, if you have any doubts, come and live with me. Watch me, see me. The Christian life is a beautiful life. Sacrificial living is a beautiful thing. Now, my dear friends, there were many hindrances that turned up. Many hindrances that turned up. Now if you turn to the third chapter and the first verse, and when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. You see, the foundations were going to be laid. The first thing that was built was, what was it? Second verse. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Jonadab, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God of Israel. The altar had disappeared. You know, we think of the decoration, we think of the windows, we think of the carpet, we think of a lot of things. We never think of the altar. The first thing that was built was the altar. What is the last thing 
in most people's life, prayer. That's the last thing. What's the first thing? If you want to rebuild your life, if you want to build anything which you can call the semblance of a real family today, it's got to be the altar. It's got to begin with the altar. And where the altar does not occupy the central place in your thoughts and planning, I can tell you the end of the story in one word, disaster. Disaster. Where there is no altar, you are guaranteeing disaster. You are writing your own obituary. The end. So they began with the altar. Today, how sad. The prayer meetings, you know, folks. One of my friends from Scotland, when he saw revival in the Hebrides, the islands west of Scotland. And when people were walking over the hills, they would suddenly stop and say, where is this music coming from? Suddenly the music from heaven we would waft over them. And people out on the sea, fishing, fishermen, would bring their boats back to the shore. And unannounced meetings, the middle of the night, the church would be full. The prayer meetings, he said to me, were the most powerful meetings. You know how it is today. In one of those islands where I preached and revival broke out, the local beer giant which is called a pub in UK, the pub began to lose its regulars. My dear friends, you know that you, some of you have heard our good friend, Pastor Homer Candle, tell you how four of these pubs, bars, or beer joints around the place in Ohio where God sent revival. It was 23 or 24 days of continual preaching in that small community. And those pubs had to shut down. And some of the workers in the pubs became missionaries here in this land, just next door to us in Ohio. Well, we don't expect the great works of God even that expectation is not there. I can't find any excitement. I'm sorry. 
but I find little excitement. You saw some of those big buildings. There was nothing there. It was just plain rice paddies and uh, coconut palms. There was nothing there when I went and saw it. And if 10,000 people come, that's not a great problem. We can fit them in, in the hall. But those are not the things that move me or excite me. The altar produces far more. That's the first thing. If the altar is missing, you will never see great things. That's out. You may see more trade centers, world trade centers, in your own life. Bluntly speaking. But you are not going to see anything of permanent value without the altar. The first thing that had to be done was the altar. And the next thing that was done was the foundations of the temple. And when the foundations of the temple were laid, some of those men that had seen the former temple wept. They wept. Really, we ought to weep, you know, over the condition of our churches today. We ought to weep the condition of the families in America today ought to make us weep. If there is any rationality about us, this is not the time for us to behave like children in a toy shop. When they saw the foundations laid, they wept. But to think that God has allowed even that temple which was built to be destroyed. at the time of Alexander. Yes, structures. You know, a man said to me, plans have been laid to rebuild the temple. I don't know whether they will ever accomplish it because Almost on that very spot, very close at least, stands the dome, which is the Muslim mosque. However, last of all, what is the hindrance to these great things? from being accomplished in your life. Now let us turn to Daniel, fourth chapter, in closing. Daniel, the fourth chapter, and the last verse says, Here is the acknowledgement of Nebuchadnezzar. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. All his works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. My dear friends, these 
these are days when there's a lot of unseen pride. I remember telling a very able preacher, there's a lot of unseen pride in you, brother. A man whom God was using. He would heal the sick and God would use him. And I loved him. But I could see that there were some sticking points in his life. Sticking points, I call you. I call them. You know, certain glue, glues are advertised in this ma manner. Even so many elephants cannot pull this apart. Once you get them stuck with this particular adhesive, even elephants can't draw them apart. Listen. If the Holy Spirit doesn't budge you, you're lost. You're lost. The Holy Spirit stirred up Cyrus' heart. The Holy Spirit pre-warned Nebuchadnezzar of what was going to happen. You're going to be driven out amongst the animals. You're going to eat the grass of the field. But he did not take that warning. But when he came back to himself, this is what he says. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Don't throw the gauntlet to God. You know, that's an old phrase. In the days of the knights, if a man threw his gauntlet down, it meant come on for a duel. Come on for a sword fight. Don't throw your gauntlet to God. It's dangerous. Nebuchadnezzar learned this lesson through much humiliation. And when men ask me, or when I wish to tell people the secret of victory, it is this. One word a broken spirit, a humble heart, a broken spirit. That is the secret. The Lord will be with you. Whatever happens, whatever success you may have in any other realm, be sure to keep that broken spirit. And there are sticking points in your life from which nothing seems to budge you. They will not be there when you have a broken spirit. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, you have told us that though you are high, you will dwell also with him who is of a broken spirit. We do not want to have any sticking points in our lives. When we say even horses can't budge me, even elephants can't budge me, but let us never come to that point of 
total folly when we throw the gauntlet to God. Oh, please have mercy and give to us to hold fast to a broken spirit. So help us. In Jesus' holy name, amen.